In 1726, Schoenig, a German schoolmaster, published a book about the life of one of his pupils, which was entitled The Life, Deeds, Travels, and Death of the Child of Lübeck. And that child was Christian Heinrich Heineken himself. Unfortunately, the name probably tells you nothing, but at that time even Immanuel Kant himself wrote about him in his book Anthropology from a Pragmatic Point of View. By now, you are probably asking yourself, what was so special about this child? One of all things is that at the age of three, he wrote the History of Denmark and recited it when the King of Denmark visited. Kant refers to Heineken in his book as Ingenium Precox, literally translated, someone precociously clever. If this child had been born today, he would be in the spotlight of all the world's spotlights. Fortunately, even though it was in the distant 1700s, Heineken has impressed everyone who has understood and touched him, and his life and development are described in great detail until his fourth year when he lost his life. However, the child from Lübeck has accomplished and learned more than many of us have in our considerably longer lives. It wasn't until 1924 that Project Gutenberg was launched to study 12 children gifted with exceptional intelligence and IQs above 180 on the Stanford Binet scale. What is the story and what happened to the child from Lübeck? Why did the Gutenberg project start and what does the first study in the world of gifted children show? How do super gifted children live? What are their abilities and how are they different from their peers? You will find out the answers to these questions in the next few minutes. On the 6th of February, 1721, in the princely bishopric of Lübeck, a small town in present-day Germany, a tiny boy was born. The fruit of the love between Paul Heineken, an artist and architect, and Katharina Elisabeth Heineken, an artist and alchemist, they named their offspring Christian Heinrich Heineken. From an early age, Christian displayed an astonishing intellect and mental maturity. According to some recorded accounts, he began to speak hours after his birth, while others suggest that it took several months. However, all accounts unanimously indicate that at 10 months, Christian was already asking highly meaningful questions and by the end of his first year, he was already familiar with the Pentateuch in detail. Imagine a one-year-old child lying around rereading the Pentateuch. Then he looks at you and says, Don't you think it's very interesting how with just one sentence Genesis 1-1, which says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, lays the foundation for biblical cosmology, and provides an introduction to the creation of the world by expressing the power and majesty of God as the creator of all things. Now, you probably understand why even royalty has been amazed and captivated by the child prodigy. By his 30th month, Christian read the entire Catholic canon and became an authority on sacred history. By the end of his third year, he was proficient in both ancient and modern history as well as the geography of the Old World, and also read Latin and French. In the same year, the still physically weak boy was weaned by his mother and ceased to be nursed. During this year of his own, the child prodigy also encounters another event unthinkable for an ordinary three-year-old. He stands trial and most coolly testifies before the jury regarding the murder of his friend, Reed, in his fourth year, Christian is already extremely famous in his region for his incredible gift. He began to study the history of the Catholic Church and to familiarize himself with its rituals. Then, Frederick IV, King of Denmark, requested his presence in Copenhagen, presumably to confirm reports of his prodigious precociousness. Christian is sent to Copenhagen and returns after a few weeks, but falls ill during the journey. Upon his return to Lübeck, Christian predicts that his end is near. His symptoms were both physical and mental. Little suffered from a severe stomach upset and prolonged insomnia, which weakened his system. 
Having been bedridden almost all the time after his return until June 27, 1725, when in response to his own prophecy, Christian Heinrich Heineken died. His funeral was attended by many notables of the time who sincerely regretted that the natural intelligence of little Christian had never reached its prime. But what has ruined the child prodigy? What is the reason the world has not seen the development of one of the greatest minds of the millennium? The answer to these questions comes only 200 years later. In fact, the young man's journey itself had nothing to do with his illness. It was merely coincidental with the timing of the development of symptoms. The understanding and identification of Christian's illness began in the 20th century, when the Dutch pediatrician Willem Carol Dick observed improvement in children with the same symptoms during World War II. Dr. Dick noticed that during periods of nutritional deficiency, when bread and other gluten foods were scarce symptoms in children improved. He found a link between gluten consumption and disease symptomatology, leading to the conclusion that excluding gluten from the diet could improve patients' health. This discovery is fundamental to understanding this disease and developing a gluten-free diet as a treatment. Today, the disease is known as celiac disease. It causes a person's body to react very badly to gluten, the protein found in wheat, barley, and rye. When people with celiac disease eat foods containing gluten, their immune system attacks and damages the small intestine. This in turn prevents them from absorbing important nutrients from the food they ingest, leading to a variety of health problems. And it is clear to you why little Heineken had such symptoms. Add in the fact that it all started shortly after he was weaned from his mother, and things seem more than clear. Unfortunately, though, in the times he lived in, all of this was still unknown, and the main foods consumed were, you guessed it, grains. Since ancient times, the manifestation of genius in the very young has been regarded as the highest form of mystery and mysticism. Such children have been viewed with both admiration and awe. However, one project, or rather, one woman, decided to study this phenomenon more seriously. Leta's project, children with an IQ above 180 on the Stanford Binet scale. Hollingworth is one of the most significant studies in the psychology of exceptionally gifted children. In 1924, Leta prepared a manuscript on children with IQs above 180, in which she reviewed the material available to date on the subject and added descriptions of five cases that she had studied individually. Over time, she delayed publication of the manuscript and added seven more cases to it. On her death in 1939, she had begun to revise this manuscript, revising what she had written in it with the intention of including the new cases. This published book, which is a continuation of Leda Hollingworth's writings, presents as much of this revision as possible. The preface and chapters 1, 2, and 3 are authentic and written by her. The descriptions of the first five cases are presented exactly as she originally wrote them, with editorial additions added which seek to present in each case such information as was found in her files after her death, without discussion or interpretation. The seven new cases, however, have not yet been described in the manuscript. It was necessary, therefore, to study the information she had gathered on each child, to seek additional information from wherever and however possible, and to present such an account of each as she herself would have written, following her pattern from the previous cases. Unfortunately, much of what the author could have contributed, had she lived to complete her project, has been lost. She knew these cases up close and personal. She has followed some of them for 20 years, taking a personal interest in the individual children and their problems, counseling them, helping them, observing them continuously, and often testing and evaluating them. Here are some observations from the study. Physical measurements show that children exceed developmental norms relative to their peers in terms of height, weight, and head circumference. They also show higher grip strength, which is consistent with their overpowering physical conditioning. 
the health status of the children is generally good, noting that the only health impairment noted is progressive myopia, which is corrected by wearing glasses. The subject's behavior in the social environment and their personality characteristics varied. Some show difficulties in social adaptation, while others cope well with their peers, showing confidence and leadership skills. Nervous stability was rated as high, with exceptions in some cases where transient nervousness was noted, particularly in the context of academic or social challenges. The children studied demonstrated exceptional academic achievement, with many passing normal educational milestones years ahead of their peers. Their intellectual development is characterized by early reading and engagement with mathematics and other science areas. Specific interests and hobbies develop from an early age, such as a love of astronomy, mathematics, and reading factual literature. These interests often develop into serious career ambitions. Even at an early age, these children have clear ideas about their career development, with desires ranging from medical professions to scientific research. These ambitions are underpinned by their passion for knowledge and the desire to achieve more in the fields that interest them most. In terms of people's attitudes towards these children in general, there are of course many people who understand and help them, but it is an unfortunate fact that there are malicious and envious people who tend to persecute these children who are officially identified as unusually gifted. Some of the children described in the report have suffered severely from the malice of various individuals, including their teachers, who have felt the impulse to bring them down to earth. It would have been interesting if a photograph of each child observed had been presented to show that in appearance they were diametrically opposed to the popular stereotype of the highly intelligent child. However, it is precisely because of the above that the photographs are not published so as not to lead to identification, and the children themselves are recorded as child A, B, C, and so on. In the description of the video, you will find a link to the full report of the nearly 300-page study. Have you ever wondered how the true face of the American frontier was represented in the 18th and 19th centuries? Bold explorers, intrepid pioneers, and cowboys who seemed to find gold as if by magic. But was life there really as idyllic as movies and novels would have us believe? Or are there dark realities and repulsive truths that no one talks about lurking behind this romanticized picture? This is a journey, another story that will have you wondering.